Our names are Kevin and Christy Brannon. Spring break started as a hobby and became a part as a part-time business in 1998, making maple syrup. In 2001, we added beekeeping. And in 2010, we purchased a maple business that had a strong maple candy business and it became a full-time job for us. In 2014, we moved into our facility as we quickly outgrew our current factory. We currently employ six full and part-time people year round. We process maple candy five to six days a week, 52 weeks out of the year. We also make maple granulated sugar, maple cream, plus other maple and honey food items. We buy and sell bulk maple syrup. We also are dealers for leader evaporator company selling maple equipment. Sugar Hill syrup jugs and artisan printing glass containers. 75% of our business is wholesale. We have a specialty gift shop at our facility that sell, sells made in Maine, New England, and or USA products. We celebrate spring with an open house on Maine Maple Sunday, give tours of our woodlot, sugar house, and kitchen facilities. We have syrup and food samples, games for the kids and families, and the biggest draw, sugar on the snow. Hi, I'm Kevin Brannon from Spring Break Maple. And today I'd like to talk to you about uh, backyard sugaring. I guess everybody that I know who makes maple syrup today on any size scale uh, started out in their backyard on a flat pan uh, on a wood fire. So today I'd like to share a few tips on making that process work for you. So the first thing we've got to do is uh, figure out if you've got some maple trees. Uh, any native maple tree can be tapped for maple syrup. First slide is of a red maple. Uh, that red maple gets a bum rap for being low on sugar content. But I found in my sugar woods that uh, I have some trees there, some red maple that have very good sugar content. So if you have them, tap them. Uh, don't shy away from them. The, uh, one of the ways of identifying, of course, is the bark. Uh, the young uh, red maple, the bark is quite smooth. The older trees, the bark is shaggy, uh, gray, uh, gray to brown. And the next species is the sugar maple. And they're a lot easier to identify when, when it's summertime and uh, there's lots of green leaves out there. But so, one of the ways of identifying is all maples have opposite bud branching and also opposite bud patterns. And the sugar maple has a brown to chocolate covered twigs and bark is gray, let's call it furs. So the next step, once you've identified some trees, uh, a dozen uh, a dozen maple trees are probably going to produce you a couple of gallons of syrup. So I would recommend starting small and figuring out your, your technique. So there's some tapping guidelines that we should follow. There's numerous types of spouts. Every manufacturer makes multiple, multiple styles. Uh, if you're gonna hang buckets, there's a couple of bucket spouts that work pretty well. I actually prefer the, uh, plastic, the newer style plastic, mainly because uh, you only have to drill a 5 16 hole in the tree versus the 7 16 hole for the old, uh, the old 17, 7 16 dial tap. Your tree should be 12 inches breast high, 
to have some larger trees over 18 inch breast high, a couple of taps uh, are, is acceptable. I wouldn't put more than that in a tree. Uh, the more holes you poke in the tree, the less uh, tree pressure there's gonna be to push the sap out of that tree. So just because you hang six buckets doesn't mean you're gonna get six times the amount of sap out of that tree. Uh, also, uh, when you drill your hole, uh, do it in one smooth motion, in and out. Uh, don't re-enter that hole with your drill because you'll end up reaming that hole out and sap will run down the side of the tree and <clears throat> you won't have a good seal on that tap. Uh, another misnomer is you have to tap at a slight angle. Uh, actually, you get the best seal uh, tapping straight into the tree. Uh, about an inch and a half is adequate for five sixteenths uh, plastic taps. Uh, seven, seven sixteenths. Uh, you can go a little deeper, uh, less than two and a half inches. So if you're tapping and you're getting, pay attention to your chips that come out of the tap hole. If you're getting dark, discolored wood, or it actually feels soft, uh, sort of punky, uh, you may not want to put a tap in that tree. Uh, just leave the hole open. Uh, within a week or two, if there's any sap that comes out of it, it'll dry off and, and uh, you won't harm the tree and uh, move on to a, a, a better tree. At the end of the season, when the sap starts slowing down, don't get the urge to either ream that hole or drill a new one. Uh, one hole per year is enough. Like I said, uh, a dozen or so trees will yield you a couple gallons of syrup. Rule of thumb is a quart per tap on an average season. Uh, we like to we like to educate the younger generation into making maple syrup. Uh, this picture here, uh, the, the little girl is using the bit and brace, the old style that, that we used 40, 50 years ago before the slick rechargeable drills we all use today. So in Northern Maine, you can see we have quite a lot of snow cover up here. Uh, we're drilling pretty low in this tree. Uh, there's probably four feet of tree underneath the snow. So uh, by the time spring does arrive, uh, that bucket's going to be going to be eye level for the little girl. So, so if you're hanging buckets, consider how much snow you have and uh, where your bucket's going to be when the snow melts. So you can hang uh, plastic buckets, uh, trees, uh, sat bags uh, are also another another way of collecting your sap. You'll expect to get eight to 10 runs during a season. Uh, one, one tree uh, on a bucket spout will probably yield eight to 10 gallons of sap in a season. Uh, you can employ tubing instead of buckets. Uh, lots of people will run uh, tubing to a five gallon bucket, maybe three or four or five trees uh, into one bucket. That works fairly well, less, less points of collection. Uh, you should have lids on all your covers. Uh, it tends to rain during the season or snow. Uh, that way you don't have to throw, throw that sap away if, if you've got a cover on it to protect it. Uh, make sure you use food grade containers. Uh, 
I've noticed a lot of uh, non-food grade containers uh, hanging on trees when you drive around uh, in the spring of the year. Uh, one that comes to mind is a kitty litter bucket that doesn't give a very good image for the industry. So make sure you're making a food product, make sure you're using food grade products all, all the way through. Uh, and if you're tapping the same tree year after year, uh, always try to locate uh, last year's tap hole. Uh, a young, vigorous tree, uh, they'll heal over in one year. Sometimes they're hard to find in one year. But try to stay at least six inches from last year's tap hole. And if you're going higher or lower than last year's, uh, it should be 18 inches above or below. Uh, that picture of the slab shows the staining that uh, happens uh, above and below and next to the tap hole. Uh, so if you drill into that, the zone, uh, we call it dead wood. That tree's not going to produce much sap that year because it's in the, the zone that uh, where the gray wood is, the stain is. Uh, there's some examples of uh, collection. I've got the plastic bucket and cover, five gallon bucket with a cover. Uh, sat bag, uh, move over to tubing. Uh, tubing works very well. If you're making drop lines, uh, short lines to actually go into the, the tree and uh, key into your, exist your uh, tubing, uh, make sure your drop lines are long enough to reach all the way around that tree. 30 to 36 inches is usually a good length. Uh, in our sugar woods, we employ a tubing system. Uh, we've got uh, miles and miles of tubing. Stretch through our woods. We uh, put our tubing in on uh, an elevation, a 3% grade. So at the end of every day, all the main lines have drained. Uh, they don't, the main lines don't freeze, they don't hold water. It's an easy way to collect sap but it's very labor intensive to install a tubing system. Uh, and there's a lot of maintenance to keeping a tubing system uh, operating correctly. Uh, during the season, that whole tubing system should be walked every day, unless you're one of the lucky ones to have a monitoring system and that monitoring system will uh, tell you where your problems are, if you have any. Sap handling, uh, if you're hanging buckets. Or running tubing into uh, bigger containers. Uh, you need to figure out how you're gonna get that back to your boiling area. Our grandkids, uh, they help us out on the weekends. They're learning the trade. So once we gather the sap and bring it back, we should try to keep it cool until it's boiled. A lot of us have full-time jobs and you're not able to boil every day. Uh, we kind of save it up for weekends. So, if that's the case, uh, and you have snow snowpack, uh, set your your container in some snow, pack snow around it. It'll keep it cool, and it'll 
it'll last a couple of days that way. Uh, once, once temperatures get up 50 degrees in the day, uh, sap's going to spoil quick. It's going to telltale sign is it'll get cloudy. And that's actually bacteria that's trying to grow in it. Uh, so if you have a tree or two that uh, is running some discolored sap, it's got a little tinge of yellow, not really clear, clear, uh, just pull that bucket. Don't collect any more from that tree. Uh, it's telling you it's done for the year. Uh, plastic tanks uh, and stainless steel tanks are the optimal uh, collection vessels. So once you get your sap back, uh, you can determine uh, the sugar content of that sap uh, with instruments. Uh, a sap hydrometer will measure the sugar content in, uh, in the sap. They're relatively inexpensive. Uh, if you're collecting 2% sap, you're going to have to boil uh, 43 gallons of that away to make a gallon of syrup. Uh, if you're lucky enough to get two and a half percent sugar, it's uh, only going to take you 34 gallons. Uh, so the sweeter it is, the less volume to make a gallon of syrup. So this picture isn't really, really clear, but uh, I think this is where the seed got planted for spring break maple. Uh, this is my great uncle's uh, operation in Smyrna. Uh, everything was done on an open, uh, rocked up arch with three to four uh, English tin uh, syrup pans. You'll notice in the picture, there's a McCulloch chainsaw sitting uh, in front. Behind that is a collection of uh, number 10 soup cans. Uh, we weren't fortunate enough to have actual sap buckets. Uh, we had a pail of uh, well-used uh, well metal spouts. Uh, and this was our evaporator. There was no roof over it. So if we got an inch of rain, it wasn't good. But we made dough. We made some, some of the best smoky maple syrup I've ever had. So that would be my great uncle that's uh, in the foreground of this picture. Uh, we helped him make maple syrup for several years back in the 70s. Uh, great memories. So I don't know which comes first, whether the chicken or the egg, but uh, it depends on how many trees you want to tap and how big your uh, flat pan is going to be. So. If you only have access to a, say, a two foot by 33 inch pan, you're probably not going to want to tap 100 trees. You probably want to keep it uh, down in the 25 taps or so. Uh, two by 33 inch uh, flat pan. It's going to evaporate about five gallons per hour. So five or six hours of boiling a day is, is uh, any more than that. And it starts to get really old and you might dislike making maple syrup every day. So match your pan to the number of taps that you have or vice versa. Don't to end up with hundreds of gallons of sap and no way to, to process it. You're just wasting a lot of energy and uh, 
you'll get discouraged fast. So match the number of taps to the size of, of your evaporator or flat pan or turkey cooker or whatever you're going to boil with the first year. Uh, a lot of people will start out with the propane turkey cooker with the big pot and uh, it's fine. You can make some maple syrup that way. Uh, the propane bill gets kind of sizable, but you can still say you made it yourself. The evaporator on the left, uh, it's a two by eight, very vintage evaporator. That was made by a Vermont evaporator company way, way back. So this evaporator is still in use, uh, even though it's probably 60 plus years old. He still uses it every spring. He has some bleachers in his evaporator room and every half hour he does a session on how to run an evaporator. He's uh, pretty entertaining to listen to. Great marketing strategy. Uh, he does a good job. So the evaporator on the right is uh, actually our evaporator in our sugar house. Uh, it's a uh, 30 by 10 uh, vortex with a steam way that evaporates approximately 240 gallons of liquid per hour. We size that evaporator to our operation so we can process uh, a day's run in about three to three and a half hours, uh, start to finish. So if you're going to boil with wood on a flat pan or a small evaporator, uh, you can expect to burn about a half a quart of wood per 50 taps. Uh, if you're using softwood, uh, that'll be a little more. So boiling. Uh, your firewood should be split into fairly small pieces, two to three inch diameter. Uh, make sure you've got sap in your pan before you build the fire. Uh, bottom of your pan won't look very flat uh, if you don't have liquid in that. Uh, make sure your pan is flat. Uh, let, I shouldn't say flat, should say level because you don't want a high corner because that's going to be an area that's going to scorch. Uh, so the shallower you run your depth, the better the evaporation rate. So if you've got six inch sides on your flat pan, uh, only run it a couple inches deep, two and a half inches deep, and keep adding sap. Uh, you have to pay close attention though, so that you don't get it too low and, and risk scorching it. Make it boil as hard as you can. If you're using a stock pot or a turkey cooker or whatever, don't boil with the cover on. Uh, make sure the cover's off. You want to get rid of that steam uh, as best as fast as you can. Part of the boiling process uh, will uh, you'll get a lot of foam once you get going good and hot. Uh, that's when you probably want to uh, add a drop or two of defoamer. Uh, there's a commercial defoamers, several different types. Uh, it's an Atmos 300. Uh, it's a very concentrated liquid. Uh, that little four ounce bottle will uh, should last the whole season for a small producer. Uh, the other is a safflower oil. Uh, that works well. So just a drop or two of that also. Uh, that'll settle the foam right down and you can continue without worry of boiling over. Finishing the syrup can be tricky. If you're boiling on a flat pan, uh, you're probably going to boil for two or three different sets, two or three sessions in a row before you take it down to actually take your syrup off. Uh, in order to do that, just stop adding syrup and boil it down, keep condensing it. Uh, so as it gets closer, keep, uh, keep an eye on the temperature. You're shooting for 219 degrees and you're not gonna be able to take it down to the full 219 degrees uh, 
on an open fire uh, on a flat pan. You're going to want to take it down to, say, 217, 216, 17, in that neighborhood, and then take it off that fire and put it in a smaller boiling pan, uh, probably on a propane or uh, kitchen range gas, uh, gas grill and finish it that way. Uh, that way you can control uh, when it's, when it's finished. Syrup is finished at seven degrees above the boiling point of water. Water is 212 degrees most days. Uh, so you're going to have finished syrup at 219 degrees. Uh, pull it off at that point. So there's a couple ways of check, checking the density of maple syrup. Thermometer is, is one way. Uh, the hydrometer and hydrometer cup is a very reliable way. And there's multiple uh, other instruments, refractometers, that measure the density of the syrup. So for the small producer, uh, probably the good grade cooking thermometer is all you need. Uh, if you want to, if you're going to actually package syrup for sale, you can double check your thermometer with the hydrometer. Now hydrometer has uh, two marks on it. It has a hot test and a cold test. Uh, so you can fill your hydrometer cup with cold syrup, which is 60 degree syrup, and it'll float. It, if it floats to the bottom red line, the cold test line, that's syrup. And the hot test is 211 degree syrup, and you float, float it to the red line on the hot test. And if it doesn't float so you can see the red line, you need to boil it a little more. And if you can see the red line and three or four marks, you've got some heavy syrup and you've got to thin it back down with some sap or even tap water. You can thin it back down with tap water, uh, bring it back to a boil and check it again. So boiling temperature is a function of density. The denser the liquid, the higher the boiling temperature. So syrup is denser than water. Syrup boils at seven degrees above the boiling point of water. So when finishing syrup, check the boiling point of water. Uh, add seven degrees to the observed observe boiling point and correct the temperature to have the per proper density syrup. So once you've made your syrup, we should filter it. A couple of different ways of doing it. Uh, cone filters, you can hang them over a deep stock pot, put the heavy syrup filter in first and put through two or three of the paper filters inside of that. Remember to always wear protective gloves when handling hot syrup. Hot syrup burns uh, quickly. Uh, the other style of filter is the flat filter. It has a heavy flat syrup filter with uh, filter papers on top of that. Uh, before you utilize your new filters, you should always rinse them in warm water several times uh, to get any of the manufacturing process out of it. Uh, and actually, when you get ready to filter syrup, uh, dampen your filter with warm water also uh, so that it doesn't absorb so much of the syrup and syrup will go through. So those filters that you're looking at are called Orlon filters. Uh, I haven't seen anything old style wool felt filters on the market for several years. So everybody is using the Orlon uh, filters for the most part. Uh, these filters don't last forever. If you use the same filter last year, uh, make sure you 
make sure they're not musty smelling because if a musty filter will make musty syrup. Nothing tastes worse than musty syrup. So uh, a lot of people buy new filters every year, not a bad practice. Uh, I would recommend a new filter every year. If you're not making enough syrup to actually use this type of filtering, you can you let your syrup settle out for maybe a day or two. And the nitre, uh, what we call sugar sand, will, will settle out and you can either pour the good syrup off the top or siphon it off the top. Just be careful not to uh, get your siphon too low so you're pulling sugar sand into your nice clean syrup. The next step will be to can your syrup, bottle your syrup. Syrup has to be hot packed to, to make sure you've got a sanitized product. So you should bottle at 185 to 190 degrees. Uh, so heat your syrup up to that temperature, put it in your container you're gonna store it in, uh, plastic syrup jug, uh, glass container, quart sealers, the ball jars work great. Just make sure you use uh, new covers and seals. Stay away from used glass containers like maybe spaghetti sauce came in because that cover will impart residue from what was in it, even if it looks clean. Uh, you put too much effort into your syrup to spoil it by putting in a used container. So when it's time to clean up after that, uh, your filters use only hot water, triple rinsed. Uh, don't use any detergents. Don't throw them in mother's wash machine and run them through the wash machine. That's, that's not good. So, uh, don't wring them out. Uh, just, uh, just pat them flat on a something that's absorbent, such as a towel, and hang them to dry. So once you've got your syrup all put into a container, you have to grade it. If you're going, especially if you're going to sell it, you have to designate what the grade is. There's four four grades: uh, golden delicate, amber rich, dark robust very dark strong so the grade is based upon the color and the flavor and the density you have to it has to be the correct density also so if you actually if you're going to sell your product you do need to be inspected licensed and inspected by the department of ag uh, they're very easy people to work with uh, they'll work with you it's not a big deal so i would i would highly recommend getting yourself licensed. Firing gloves. Make sure your make sure your practices are safe. Uh, when you're firing your evaporator, uh, wear some good heavy glove. And when you're handling syrup, uh, the rubber gloves work exceptional. Hot syrup won't uh, burn through burn you through that. In our neck of the woods in northern Maine, uh, very rarely that uh, we tap trees without using snowshoes. Uh, we get four to six feet of snow up here uh, easily every winter. So I'd like to share a few uh, few maple facts. Uh, so last year, uh, Maine produced, uh, Maine had 1,890,000 taps in the woods. Uh, that produced 495,000 gallons of maple syrup. Uh, that was actually down from the last couple of years. Uh, last year was, uh, production was down uh, nationwide. Somerset County is actually the largest maple producing county in the US. The maple producers actually uh, employed the University of Maine to do an ec economic impact study last year. So the annual contribution for maple was $29.8 million. Uh, created 634 full and part-time jobs, 
16.8 million in labor income. Uh, just some things to think about. So I guess this concludes my talk. I'll feel available to try to answer any questions that anybody might have. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Christy and Kevin, so much for that presentation. That was very thorough and just well put together. I, uh, I'll admit I went to school in Southern Illinois and I took a class on maple syrup production and we didn't cover some of the things that you guys covered in your presentation. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, I wanna open it up for questions. I'm sure everybody has uh, questions here. Um, seems to be a popular topic, but I guess my first question for you guys is, what kind or what grade of maple syrup do you guys make on your farm there? Uh, we make actually all grades. Uh, the most common grades that we make is the amber rich and and the dark robust. That's our most common uh, syrup grade that we make. Thank you. And I, I was so surprised when I visited you guys with Dan Jacobs, I think it was this time last year, that you told me those grading kits that you showed in your presentation that is that they send you guys a new one every year. Is that how you grade it? You get a new kit every year? We purchase a new kit every year. There. OK. Yeah. So those standards are almost on like a <laughs> yearly level. Well, that's called a temporary kit and over okay. time they will fade. So uh, they're usually good for a couple of years, but beyond that, they're they're not that accurate. There are permanent grade kits that can be purchased for uh, considerable considerable amount of money. So okay, yeah, that's, that's thank you very much. It looks like we have a question here in the chat. What was the minimum breast height measurement to tap a tree? Uh, 12 inches is the standard, uh, 12 inches breast high. Like Kevin well, said during his presentation, that might be different uh, depending on the snow there. <laughs> so make sure you're accounting for where the actual uh, basal flare at the tree is when you're going up. Do we have any more questions while we have Christy and Kevin? On with us. If anyone thinks of a question later, would it be okay to share your email with the group? Sure. Great. Thank you. So somebody said that they have a uh, few maples, but a lot of birch trees. I've heard you can tap birch trees, but I've never tried. <laughs> the birch season starts right after the maple season. So if you're really gung ho, Tap your maple and jump right into birch. And if you don't have a lot of maple, tap your birch. It's uh, it's a lot different boiling birch sap than it is maple. And I advise from experiences that outside is the best place to boil. It's not as nice smelling as maple. <laughs> I've heard it's good on savory foods and ice cream, so uh, I've only ever had it on the ice cream. Oh, here we got another question here. Where can folks purchase the supplies if they're wanting to do this at home, maybe on a smaller scale? Uh, there's uh, maple equipment dealers uh, statewide, different, uh, different companies have uh, representatives uh, of the state just uh, kind of depends on what area you're in. We also sell maple equipment up here, um, but for some people it might be too far of commute. <clears throat> Definitely worth a visit if you guys are in the area. Um, they have a wonderful shop there where, like Christy was saying, they sell the equipment and also the maple candy, cream, syrups. 
and they do a fabulous uh, Maine Maple su Sunday uh, get together there too, usually. So, are you guys doing that this year? We are. Oh, good. And uh, we have our Maine Forester coming to do our woodlot tour again. <clears throat> so, wonderful and wonderful. Who is your forester, Christy? Dan Dan Jacobs. Oh, Dan Jacobs, wonderful. Dan Jacobs uh, worked for Maine Forest Service. He recently took a position as a regional enforcement coordinator. So if you guys yeah. are interested. Yeah, I talked to him, um, but he's um, he's still based out of Island Falls, he said. So, okay. uh, so he's gonna be um, doing our tour again and he does an excellent tour, so. He does. Dan is very entertaining. So if you guys, uh, if you're in the area for Maine Maple Sunday, that's that'd be a great stop. Uh, it looks like we have another question here. What determines the color of the syrup? That is a good question. Mother Nature determines that all by herself. Uh, part of it, though, is how quickly you take care of your sap. Uh, the quicker you boil it and put it into syrup. And normally lighter that syrup's going to be. If you're holding sap for three or four or five days, you're probably going to make a darker, uh, more robust flavored syrup. Uh, and in uh, today's email, there is a link to Christy and Kevin's uh, farm there. So if you guys are interested in more information or uh, looking for directions. Oh, yep, and George just put it there too. So um, if we have any more questions for Kevin and Christy, otherwise I'm going to let uh, Joe set up here. And we will share uh, Christy's email there. So if you guys have questions, we'll put the website and her email. So feel free to reach out. And if there's anything else we can help with, you guys can shoot me or Julie an email too. That being said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass the mic off here to Joe, see if we can get it set up so he can share. Thank you so much, Kevin and Christy, for I know you had to do some little rearranging with your schedules here, and I so appreciate you being on tonight. This was just wonderful. Thank, thank you for the opportunity.